Welcome to the second part of an ongoing series on the life and battles of Quintus Sertorius, Roman rebel general and ruler of Hispania during the late Republic. Previously we focused on the earlier life of Quintus, from his origins to his disastrous first battle at Aracio. The Battle of Aracio had been nothing short of a massacre, with few survivors, but the experience far from broke the military tribune. It's not certain why the Cimbri and Teutons chose not to march south into the vulnerable and fertile Roman heartland. One possibility is that seasonal considerations stayed the barbarians' collective hand. The battle had been fought in early October, and autumn would soon devolve into winter. Maybe they balked at a crossing across the Alps during this time, rather taking the easier route to glory and plunder in Hispania. Sertorius, as one of the few survivors, may have been forgiven for not wanting to look upon another barbarian for the rest of his life. However, the opposite was true. His duty and eagerness to serve Rome burned strong, and the young man simply transferred his allegiance to a far more promising commander in Gaius Marius, who now entered this northern theatre. Sertorius, though, would not camp in wait for the barbarian menace to re-emerge with his general, but instead elected to accompany that very enemy as one of them. That such work once more reaffirms Sertorius's great courage goes without saying, but his long mission also confirms other traits of the man. A sharp mind, and perhaps aptitude, if not an outright gift, for languages. Sertorius had a basic understanding of the barbarian tongue, and may have accompanied them for many months, or even up to their reappearance in southern Gaul. If a longer mission was undertaken, we can be reasonably sure his linguistic skills rapidly improved, giving anything else would have left the Roman exposed to discovery and death. Given this consideration of discovery, we can also assume Quintus was also not necessarily quintessentially Roman looking, likely being paler, taller, and maybe even blonde or fair-haired and blue-eyed in appearance at least to the extent he could superficially blend in as a barbarian for many months and into years. A shorter and suavier man may have simply stuck out like a sore thumb and had a short term of service as a result. Another important point to consider in the development of our hero moving onwards is the cultural experience. Though Sertorius would remain firmly Roman in his own culture and identity throughout his life, even into the years of his rebellion and rule in Hispania, the experience of living and fighting with these men must have constructed an empathy and understanding of un-Roman ideas and views that would prove useful later on in building up his own support and power. This in an era where Roman elites were notorious for their pig-headed obstinacy in not considering any other views outside of their Roman cultural context. Following Horatio, the huge barbarian host split Sertorius perhaps marching with the Cimbri into Hispania, the Teutons and Ambronis remained to plague the people of southwestern Gaul. As many Roman armies and Sertorius's future enemies would too, the Germanic tribe did not fare well in the heat and tough terrain of the Iberian interior, its people proving as tough and irritable as the land and climate. Withdrawing back into Gaul, the reunited horde now moved to strike the Italian peninsula in 102 BC. Details on Sertorius's service are vague enough that it's possible it was only at this point, after some years, that the bearded and bloodied Roman spy broke away from his barbarian comrades to rejoin Marius. Now is a good time to digress for a while into Sertorius's new commander as the life of our subject is tied inextricably with the affiliation and career of this great captain. Gaius Marius, like Sertorius, was a homo novus, born into an Equites family in Arpinum, that also happened to be the hometown of the famous Cicero. As a new man, Marius too, like Sertorius, had forged his path to prominence through military service serving under the famed Scipio Aemilianus in the Numantine conflict of 133 BC. He had initially rose politically under the patronage of the great family Cassili Metelli, but later turned into a bitter foe of the family when he became a populous tribune of the plebs. Having failed to be elected Aedal, Marius was able to scrape into the praetorship and, like his subordinate, served as a provincial governor 
rather successfully, in Hispania. Marius confirmed his populist affiliation, however, upon his return to Rome, becoming a fawn in the side of his former patron, Metellus, in the Jugurthine War. As a legate under Metellus, Marius worked hard to ingratiate himself with the rank and file, sharing in their diet and hardships, as well as through raw courage in the field. Metellus, though, determined correctly that his legate was manoeuvring himself for a shot at the consulship and was undermining his authority. Having sent representatives to Rome to spread rumours of Metellus's supposed incompetence in not finishing the war, as well as making his own disruptive presence in camp bitterly felt, Metellus finally allowed his errant officer to leave to travel to Rome and run for the consulship, but only at the last minute, which Marius did, and he won in 107 BC. Marius also succeeded in having command of the Jugurthine War transferred to him. The enraged Metellus refused to even meet with his former legate, instead leaving the theatre as a private citizen and having his own legate, Rutilius Rufus, hand over command. In the event, Marius's promised rapid victory over Jugurtha never materialised. Taking command in 107 BC, Marius found that his only viable strategy was to adopt that Metellus had in denying their enemy local support and reinforcement. Eventually though, Marius himself was ironically outshone by his own subordinate in Lucius Cornelius Sulla. It was Sulla who orchestrated and executed the operation that took him to the court of the king of Mauritania, where he persuaded the king to hand over Jugurtha himself. Though claiming credit for ending the war as Sulla's superior officer, Marius chafed under the accusations that victory belonged to other men. Metellus, who had masterminded the strategy, and Sulla, who actually concluded matters. Marius, however, had fulfilled his promise in bringing the African war to an end at least, and was popular in Rome, being duly elected to the consulship again in 104 BC. During the intervening years in which Sertorius may have been serving with the enemy, Marius was training and rebuilding a northern force. The sheer attrition of losses in the great battles against the tribes necessitated a relaxation of the usual property qualifications of legionaries. Whatever else could be said of Marius, he knew his true craft as a general, favouring a cautious if aggressive tactic of closely shadowing an enemy while keeping secure in a well-fortified camp. He was also aware of the importance of choosing the field of battle and gaining every advantage before engaging, allowing his enemies to break like waves on his well-maintained, fortified camps. He also bred in both the enemy and his own men an insatiable desire to fight rather than languish in limbo. It was when following this tactic that Marius near Aquae Sextiae in 102 BC destroyed around 30,000 Ambronis during an initial battle and then slew upwards of 100,000 in total when the Teutons and remaining Ambronis counterattacked by assaulting the Romans up a hill, with Marcus Claudius Macellus smashing the barbarian rear to complete the slaughter. It's highly probable that Sertorius fought in both this battle and the Battle of Vercelli the next year. Combining with the army of his fellow consul Quintus Lutatius Catullus, some 52,000 Romans faced down an estimated 180,000 Cimbri. Unlike his usual practice, however, the time and place of battle was mutually agreed. Catullus took the centre and Marius's men the wings, the intent being that the weaker centre would likely fall in on itself, while the wings would advance and envelop. It's also possible that Marius, hungry for credit and jealous of anyone else gaining it, also wanted the best chance of monopolising the glory. The Cimbri attempted to smash the shaky Catalan centre and avoid the Marian wings. However, this tactic was never truly tested, as the Cimbri cavalry was defeated and routed, streaming back into their own ranks and causing disruption. This allowed Catullus to follow up with a general advance that crushed the barbarian main body. Given the barbarian wedge formation, Marius was largely absent from the main action, marching beyond the main area of contention and finding the melee behind him. No doubt the very presence of the Marian wings did contribute to the collapse in morale of the Cimbri being cut down, given they would eventually close in too. 
As the overall commander of the Romans that day, Marius once again could claim some credit for the victory of Vesselae, though any half-fair observer would note the obvious prime role of Catullus' army in destroying the Cimbri. What may have rankled the most for Marius was that the vital cavalry victory that set the foundation for overall victory was directed by none other than the same man who had arguably stolen Marius's glory in Numidia, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. As with his patron Marius, Sulla would prove as hated and deadly an enemy to Sertorius, this pro-Marian and anti-Sullan alignment dictating the course and battles of Sertorius's life. Aquae Sextii and Vesselae were likely enlightening lessons for Sertorius, just as Horatio had been a bloody lesson in how not to command. Marius had shown the way to great command. Though bravery and skill at arms were important, these did not always guarantee victory against a determined and ferocious foe like the Germanic tribes. Army after army had fallen to the barbarian sword, brave soldiers all. Marius proved a bright example of a clever tactician and patient fighter. He set the terms of engagement, always emphasising his strengths holding a strong defensive position in his camps or on the hill like at the first battle. He also accustomed his men to the sight, style and culture of their foes, and only when they had begged him to fight did he allow an engagement at Aquae Sextia. Such shadowing and attritional tactics was not heroic in and of itself, but it had proved successful. Next time, Sertorius hitches his wagon to Marius and fully commits to the populist cause. Also, his first independent action sees wild success and the award of Rome's highest military honour.